uh, time and time again with, um, well, with the uh, previous session with this government, as, uh, and, and again in this session so far as well, as uh, they like to talk about consultation. They like to say that they've consulted with Canadians from coast to coast to coast to coast. Um, to, well, I, I think I said four. Um, but I, I wonder through you, Mr. Speaker, if our honourable colleague knows if, uh, uh, well, if indeed the RCMP and CBSA frontline officers were consulted with, uh, in, it, with respect to C3. Member for Langley Aldergrove. Thank you to uh, my colleague for his question. Uh, while this party supports uh, Bill C3, we are disappointed that there has been a lack of consultation uh, with key stakeholders and leaders, uh, with the RCMP, uh, with the CBSA, and uh, with the unions representing the people who work uh, for those great organizations. Uh, so uh, it's a disappointment. Uh, that said, uh, uh, the, the, the bill will be effective in, uh, uh, to a large part for uh, enhancing the work that these organizations are doing. But the uh, lack of consultation has been and continues to be problematic. We'll take another uh, question and response. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Ma Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. I listened with interest as the member opposite talked about trying to extend border crossing hours in his riding. Uh, it's something I think any, any riding that has a, a, a U.S. facing or a, a border uh, crossing um, uh, boundary is, is interested in. The previous government uh, under, under the Harper uh, under the, the previous Harper government, cut border investments by, by $390 million. I was wondering if the member also could reflect upon whether a budget cut of $390 million would, would extend hours, or in fact would, would not only curtail hours, but also curtail security at the border. Whether, whether cutting money from budget, for, for the budget for, for border crossing is a way to realize his goal, or whether it would require an investment. Member for Langley Aldergrove. Uh, my advice, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, that is misleading, that, uh, that the public accounts do not uh, support that uh, allegation. Uh, I just, but I will take the opportunity to uh, reiterate how important it would be to my riding uh, to have that border open 24-7. It would have the support, uh, not only of Langley Aldergrove, but surrounding uh, uh, regions as well. Uh, and it would certainly have the support of uh, uh, businesses in the Chamber of Commerce in Whatcom County. I think it's time that uh, we move ahead with that. There are other uh, border crossings that are 24-7, but recently there was flooding at the Sumas border crossing. Uh, so a lot of traffic was then redirected to the langley Aldergrove border crossing, which is only open for uh, 20 hours uh, a day. And there were big, long light-ups, which I personally also was subjected to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove will actually have two minutes remaining in the period for question and comments. Uh, should he wish to take that when the House gets back to debate on the question? Uh, but we'll now go to uh, statements by members. Declaration de député. The Honourable Member for Sackville, Preston Chesicook. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, this month is Black History Month. Like the monumental role of African Canadian communities have played in the Canadian history. No African community, uh, Canadian community has had such a long and rich history as the African Nova Scotian community. This community has given birth to some incredible historic figures, such as civil rights activists Viola Desmond, world renowned singers Portia White, and Victoria Cross recipient William Day. This community was the first African Canadian community to touch Canada and the oldest generational community of African descent in our nation. Many uh, members of the African Nova Scotian community reside in North Preston, East Preston, Lake Loon, Cherry Brook, and surrounding areas. And I'm a very, very proud to be their member of parliament. And I encourage everyone in this house and in this, this country to learn more about the important contri contribution of African Canadians. Thank you. Oh. The Honourable Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to salute Navigator Edward McCloskey, native son of Maidstone, missing in action in France during World War II. With credit to Essex Free Press reporter Silene Argent, and thanks to Mark McGuire, also of Maidstone, for his account. While living in France in 1989, Mark learned through a newfound friend that in July 1944, he and his mother saw a low-flying plane with RCAF insignia, followed by an exchange of gunfire and a large explosion. 
Learning that the crew was buried at the Commonwealth Cemetery nearby, Mark paid his respects. He paused at one of the tombstones. It read, E.J. McCloskey, Navigator. 30 years later, Navigator McCloskey's niece, Marilyn Scratch, approached Mark to ask if he was the one that found Uncle Ed. He was able to provide photos of the headstone and valuable closure to the family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey, here. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Speaker, every morning under the cloak of darkness, thousands of kids across Canada jump into swimming pools with dreams of Olympic glory. The drive to make a personal best, to perfect a turn or start or ultimately reach the podium is the product of incredible individual will and might, but it's never done alone. Each morning these athletes dive into the water to train. There are coaches across Canada that are literally on deck walking alongside these young athletes as they drive forward. Great coaches don't just create champions, they help create leaders. They build strong futures for these kids and help them grow as they compete. This week, Swim Canada lost one of its best coaches, and the families whose kids swim for the North York Athletic Club have lost a friend, a mentor, someone who helped propel a generation of Canadians towards Olympic glory and well beyond. Murray Drudge's sudden passing has broken hearts and shocked the swim community, but the dreams he's given shape to, the dreams of Olympic gold and the scholarship opportunities that live on through these young athletes as trained are his legacy. These are Murray's legacy. These are his personal best. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The number of temporary workers in Canada is increasing and becoming a large part of the workforce, short-term, temporary and contract work. It's a disturbing trend. They earn 20% less than those with permanent jobs, have fewer or no benefits and little security. No wonder it's been called precarious work, and it affects a lot of young people. Over 2 million Canadians are in temporary jobs, more than 13% of those employed. In Atlantic Canada, it's worse. 21% in PEI, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, 26%. Workers at Canada Post in St. John's are fed up. One plant has 90 temporary workers out of a workforce of 200, nearly half, some with Canada Post for five to 10 years. The corporation seems determined to rely more and more on temporary workers, replacing retiring or transferred employees with temps. The Liberal government and the minister should reverse that trend, do what it takes to reverse it at Canada Post to ensure permanent, full-time employment where possible. Canada Post should be setting an example, providing quality jobs along with quality service. Here, here. Honourable Member for Kitchener South, Hespler. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to draw the attention to the many Lebanese who are out on the streets protesting inequality and lack of opportunity due to the dire economic crisis. Lebanon is the third highest indebted country in the world. In 2016, payments consumed 48% of the government's revenues, limiting their ability to make much-needed investments in infrastructure and public services. The top 1% of Lebanese receive approximately 25% of Lebanon's national income, while the bottom 50% of the population is left with 10%, making Lebanon one of the countries with the worst income equality in the world. Protesters are demanding equality and a brighter future for themselves, their families, and all Lebanese citizens. Gibran Khalil, a famous Lebanese poet, once wrote, out of suffering has emerged the strongest souls. Mr. Speaker, I stand uh, with the strong and bold Lebanese that are protesting for a brighter future for all of Lebanon. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, as you know, one of the greatest gifts in life is having a child. Unfortunately, some families face the daily challenge of raising a child with a disability. I'd like to highlight the work of an organization in my riding that provides support and respite to many families dealing with these challenges, the Association d'Entraide Communautaire. This association was founded in 1996, and its mission is to provide services to the families of individuals with physical or intellectual disabilities or autism spectrum disorders. This is help that is critical for parents who need to refuel and spend time with other family members. I'd like to congratulate the devoted and committed team at this association. Despite the challenges they faced before the holidays, they rolled up their sleeves and continued to provide support to families so that our children can continue to be the very best gifts in the world. Long live this wonderful organization. Three. The Barians recently joined more than a dozen police officers for an informal one-on-one -on -one Friday afternoon chat at a South End coffee shop. Once things got brewing, no topic was off limits. Maintaining community trust can be a challenge for police. Heureusement, à Sudbury. Fortunately, in Sudbury, our police officers are a part of our community. They work here, live here, and play here. I commend the efforts of Constable Mickey Teed of the Greater Sudbury Police Service. He helped launch Coffee with a Cop, 
in order to give the public an opportunity to talk with police, share some stories, and ask some questions that they would normally not get a chance to ask. As a local MP, I'm happy to report that more Coffee with a Cop get-togethers are planned for other parts of Sudbury. Together, let's continue building bridges between cops and community in Tausa de Foix. One, One cup at a time. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, February 8th, the Africa Festival of Arts and Culture hosted a Black History Month dinner at Mount St. Vincent University. Everyone there got to experience the magnificent tastes and sounds of Africa. This event commemorates the contribution of Canadians of African descent during wartime of William Hall, the first Nova Scotian to receive the Victoria Cross. The members of the 2nd Battalion, the 2nd Construction Battalion, who stood out during the First World War, as well as those who served during the Second World War and other conflicts, often making the ultimate sacrifice. James is that so little credit was given to these heroes for so long, and rarely during their lifetimes. The tremendous contributions made by black Canadians to our country deserve our respect and admiration. We can do better. Hello. The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak on behalf of the working men and women across this great country. The individuals who make sure our homes are warm, our transportation moves, and our children are fed. Over the past five years, working people of our country have found it more and more difficult. And unfortunately, this government is putting prosperity out of the hands of way too many. Self-inflicted wounds like the carbon tax and the blockade are creating conditions for a devastating made-in-Canada recession. The working people of our country see right through the rhetoric and platitudes, and they demand action. They demand a Prime Minister who will stand up for the working people of our country. Honourable Member for Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've stood here before and spoke of the amazing technology that the advancements that are taking place in Canada, Canada's largest high technology park. The future of technology in Canada and Canada has never been brighter. Merge Robotics and the Earl of March Lions are just two of the local robotics clubs made up of young students, mentored by dedicated engineers, scientists, business leaders, and talented university students. Two exciting events will be taking place soon. The first is the 2020 Robot Reveal Open House to be held February 26 between 6.30 and 8.30 at the Beaver Brook Public Library in Canada. The Merge Robotic students will be on hand to show off their new robot. And also, for the first time, Ottawa will be hosting a robotics competition at Carleton University, March 13th to the 15th. Many local teams are participating. This event is free to the public and I encourage everyone to come out and encourage these young people. The future is bright, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Sinokameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, a very, very exciting thing is happening next week in my riding, more precisely in the community of Merritt. Now, what's so exciting, you might ask? The dinosaurs are coming. Well, more accurately, next week, Jurassic World 3 will be filming in the area. We should never overlook the importance of the BC film industry Absolutely. and the significant contributions that film productions create for local economies. Mm -hmm. In the 2018-2019 fiscal year, Creative BC reported that 384 productions contributed wow. $3.2 billion wow. to British Incredible. Columbia's economy alone. Absolutely. This is great news for British Columbia, and the case of Jurassic World 3 is terrific news for Merritt. Mm -hmm. Now, I should also mention that the production has also had a casting call for local citizens. Now, according to the casting call, they're looking for people to play dinosaur food. Mr. Speaker, please join me in recognizing the community of Merritt for being the perfect place to feed dinosaurs. Oh, amen! The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, retired Senator Bob Runciman had a political career spanning 45 years at the local, provincial and federal levels a senior cabinet minister in Ontario and twice the interim leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. None of it would have been possible without the loving support of his wife, Jeanette. Tragically, Jeanette passed away last week. Her sense of humour, sound political instincts and common sense made her the senator's greatest advisor. Jeanette was authentic and humble. 
She was an environmentalist before it was trendy and a great lover and defender of animals her whole life. She was a loving mother, wife, grandmother, and aunt. Her family meant everything to her. Her daughters, Robin and Sue, have lost a mother, but also their best friend. The Runcimans would have celebrated 56 years of marriage next month. A great love story ended by a terrible tragedy. Jeanette, thank you for your commitment to our community. You will be dearly missed. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, last September I was invited by Sashat First Nation to witness a solemn ceremony on the site of the former Alberni Indian Residential School. More than 450 people from 88 First Nations gathered to reclaim the lost souls of the many Indigenous children who attended and those that died over 92 years while attending this school. The ceremony was a first step in creating a cultural way for the spirits of these children to be reclaimed. Many of the participants at the Reclaiming Lost Souls ceremony had returned to this place for the first time since the school closed in 1973. As a witness, I bring this message from those who are doing this very important work. There is still much intergenerational healing needed from the trauma experienced by many generations of children attending residential schools. The federal government needs to invest more funding and resources into tearing down these schools and supporting healing initiatives across Canada. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to Ms. Sonia Poirier, an extraordinary woman in my riding who embodies the courage, resilience and strength of the residents of the North Shore. In 2018, Ms. Poirier saved the lives of her daughter and her best friend when their boat overturned, when her brother-in-law and her spouse disappeared in the glacial waters of a lake. She had to swim for several hours and she spent the night warding off the cold in order to protect these young women until help arrived. Involved in her community, a proud member of the great Rotary family, as was Bruno, her deceased spouse, Mouz Barrier wrote about this critical turning point in her life in order to show that despite the tragedies that may befall us, we can and must choose life. Ms. Poirier, Sonia, through our talks, I discovered a courageous, dynamic and intelligent woman who wants to follow her dreams while cherishing her memories and the moments spent with those you lost. Your heroism is an inspiration to me, the North Shore and all Quebecers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Canada's economic future must be in our own hands. This Liberal government cannot listen to a few out-of-touch elites who are intent in shutting down Canada's energy sector. A group of Nobel Prize winners has written to the Prime Minister asking him to deny the tech frontier mine in northern Alberta. Have they visited northern Alberta and spoken to the 14 First Nations who support this project because of the jobs and the prosperity it will create? Have they met with Canada's own joint advisory panel who reviewed the science and evidence and deemed this project to be in the best interests of this country? Did they actually read the panel's report which outlines how Tech's Frontier Mine will actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by replacing dirty coal with clean Canadian natural gas? Nope. Did they meet with Tech, who's actually committed to have zero net emissions by 2050, 2050 in line with the government's own targets? Nope. This is a $20 billion project that is good for Alberta, that's good for Canada. Albertans support it, First Nations support it, Canadians support it. These elites should get out of the way and let Canada do what we do best, working to develop sustainable, clean energy. today to acknowledge the tireless efforts of community organizations in combating racism and xenophobia stemming from the coronavirus outbreak. In Scarborough North, open forums were recently held at the Chinese Cultural Centre of Greater Toronto and at Woodside Square with the Chinese Canadian National Council. Public health officials were on hand to hear concerns from residents, help clear misconceptions and handled questions with facts. While there continues to be ignorance and incidents of discrimination towards the Chinese community, it is fear that 
we must unite to overcome. Fear is what threatens to undermine our core values, destroy businesses, and damage community relations. Let us tackle fear by supporting one another, our neighbors, restaurants, grocery stores, and local shops. As Canadians across the country raise funds and send supplies to China, let us stand together with the frontline medical personnel currently working around the clock to save lives. Let us continue to demonstrate our care and compassion as Canadians. Merci to Le Monde. Thank you, everyone. Oral questions. Uh, questions are all. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Project has been given consent by the majority of the Wet'suwet'en people, but their voices are being ignored by these Liberals. Rita George, one of their matriarchs, said, the world thinks the matriarchs are behind all the protests going on, and that's not true. None of the matriarchs were contacted. I want the world to know what's been happening to us. We're being bullied. It's so shameful, so hurtful. We're being humiliated. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals ignoring the majority of Wet'suwet'en people and instead empowering bullies and lawbreakers? Here, here. The Honourable Partner Secretary the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, our government is seized with this issue and, the, and we believe that dialogue is the best and most preferred way to deal with these matters. Our minister was in Victoria on Monday. We have, uh, we've had a series of conversations with the hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en, and the minister spoke to several chiefs on Tuesday. The minister reiterated our government's commitment to a joint meeting with the hereditary leadership of the Wet'suwet'en peoples and the province of British Columbia. This was also echoed in a joint letter with our counterpart from BC. We are open and available to meet in person at the earliest opportunity. Thank you. Well, opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, thousands of Canadians are being laid off and their families don't know when they're going to see a paycheck again. Billions of dollars of essential goods can't get to their destination and the economic impact is dire. In fact, Atlantic Container Lines say they will no longer ship goods to Halifax while these blockades continue. There are worries about propane shortages and higher food prices as a result of this Prime Minister's weak leadership. How much worse does it have to get before the Prime Minister is going to step up and stop these illegal blockades? The Honourable Parliament Secretary the Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the government fully understands and is deeply concerned by the impact the blockades are having on small business, farmers who rely on freight rail, rail employees, as well as towns and communities who need rail service to get essential products such as chlorine to treat their drinking water. We are working with all levels of government to find a swift resolution to these blockades. The Prime Minister has convened a call with his provincial counterparts yesterday. We are encouraged by the progress in the blockade in New Hazelton, British Columbia. We are actively working for a similar resolution on all remaining blockades. Opposition leader. And emboldening lawbreakers and bullies, this government is setting the stage for more disruption and anarchy in this country. Right. Our economy is being shut down, jobs are being lost, and the voices of First Nations people is being ignored. The best interest of Canadians is being ignored. The Liberal inaction on this is disgraceful. When will this lib Liberal government stand up for law and order, stand up for First Nations rights, stand up for jobs, and end these illegal blockades? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We, we recognize that this situation is very worrisome for Canadians and for the transportation of people and goods, and a consensus emerged yesterday among the premiers. We want to continue the dialogue in order to come up with a peaceful solution as quickly as possible. It's time for the barricades to come down. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The problem is that the barricades are still there because of this government's flagrant inaction for two weeks. That's the reality. Meanwhile, victims are piling up. Today, we learned that the Gaspé Rail Company will be laying off half its personnel. That's 15 heads of family that no longer have a job or salary. What is the government doing? What does the government have to say to those people? The question is simple. Can the Minister of Revenue from the Gaspé, what does she have to say to those heads of families, heads of households who've lost their jobs, other than be patient? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a situation we take very seriously. The ministers are we're all working to find a solution. 
but we want it to be a peaceful solution to this conflict, and it requires dialogue. Dialogue has limits. We recognize that. And the member opposite has oversimplified a problem that is very complex, and he should be more careful. The Honorable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the people of the Gaspé have just understood that, unfortunately, their member, their minister, has been muzzled and cannot speak directly to the people of Gaspé, but they will have to live with their choices. Over the past two weeks, the government has done nothing while the situation worsens for farmers. The head of the UPA wrote to the prime minister and said, we don't get the feeling that the government intends to act swiftly. Can the Minister of Agriculture, a member from Quebec, tell the head of the UPA what the government is doing other than saying, be patient? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're, I'm very pleased to answer my colleague opposite. Uh, the Quebec caucus is particularly concerned about this. We want a quick solution, but it has to go through dialogue and peacefully. The premiers agree that we have to continue pursuing dialogue, but there are limits, and we are certainly exhausting all options to find a way out of this crisis. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister must take concrete steps to resolve the railway crisis today. No one wants to see another photo of him in an armchair chit-chatting with his colleagues. We want to see him outside wearing a coat, talking to Indigenous leaders. We want him to confirm there are no more RCMP officers on Wet'suwet'en territory, and that the pipeline and the controversy are on hold while discussions are ongoing. Will the government finally get down to it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Le President. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague. Who is seized with the situation and are working around the clock on an ongoing basis. We all want peace. We all want to get rail traffic going across the country, Mr. Speaker. As, a, as our Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and Indigenous Services have stated, they're ready and willing to meet with the hereditary leadership at the earliest opportunity. With the BCRCMP's outreach to the chiefs yesterday, we hope this creates the ability to advance a peaceful resolution. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, Thousands of workers have already received layoff notices because of the railway blockades. Via Rail, CN, all across Quebec, companies are companies of all sizes are warning they will soon have to lay workers off too. It's time the government took action. Sending letters is not dialogue. It needs to be in person between a prime minister and chiefs, nation to nation. What concrete steps? Are the is the government taking so that by Monday morning this crisis is behind us? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transport. I'm fully aware and deeply concerned by the impact and decision CN was forced to take and its consequent impact on Via Rail, as well as the people who rely on freight rail and rail employees. The Department has been in constant communication with CN and CP. Furthermore, the Prime Minister has convened the Incident Response Group with members of our team to discuss the situation and assess our path forward. All parties must engage in open and respectful dialogue to ensure the situation is resolved peacefully. We strongly urge the parties to do so. Honourable Member for Couch and Malahat, Langford. Mr. Speaker, less than three years ago, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, no relationship is more important to Canada than the relationship with Indigenous peoples. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has fallen a long way since then. Weeks ago, when we asked the Prime Minister to step up to de-escalate the situation in Wet'suwet'en territories, he said it wasn't his problem. Mr. Speaker, it was then, it is now. When will he meet with the hereditary chiefs? The Honourable Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, our government Mr. Speaker, our government is seized with this matter. The Prime Minister has a cabinet that is working on the situation around the clock, and we all want peace and we want to get real traffic going across the country. As the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and Indigenous Services have stated, they're ready and willing to meet the hereditary leadership at the earliest opportunity. And with the BC's RCMP outreach to the chiefs yesterday, we hope that this creates the ability to advance peaceful resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, 
with all due respect, that was a lot of talking points from the member opposite, but not an answer to our question. We will ask again. When will the Prime Minister meet with the hereditary chiefs? Yeah, yeah. Honourable Parliament Secretary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to reiterate that we have a government that sees with this matter. We have a number of ministers who have been working around the clock to address the situation on an urgent basis, and we will continue to do so in a diligent and urgent manner. But what's important is that we move forward at the same time to understand the long-term needs towards reconciliation, and what is important is that we focus on ensuring that we have a peaceful solution to this matter, at the same time ensuring that our long-term relationship is maintained and restored. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, supplies of propane in eastern Canada are reaching a critical level, and there is no reliable backup for businesses, farms, and residences, including many seniors' homes that need fuel. Distributors are now rationing what's in stock as they deal with energy insecurity. Mere days of propane supply are on hand as this Prime Minister makes the precarious calculation that he can wait out the problem. When will the Prime Minister finally take critical action and end the blockades? Or will he leave seniors out in the cold? Parliament Secretary, Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we understand the important impacts that these blockades are having on many communities across the country. Rail transport is essential to many communities in Atlantic provinces and in Quebec that rely on propane for their supplies. We understand that the path forward to a sustainable resolution of the blockades is through dialogue, and this is the approach we are using. We are working tirelessly for a swift resolution to these blockades to ensure that essential goods can be delivered to our communities. Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Propane shortages in Quebec are forcing companies to ration supply to hospitals and farms. Capital Propane in Quebec City is now rationing its seven-day reserve. Although emergency plans are now in place and businesses are switching to trucking, this will not make up for the losses caused by the blockades. When will this Prime Minister take steps so that propane companies in Quebec don't have to choose between farmers and patients? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we understand that the barricades are currently having serious impacts on propane supply in the Atlantic provinces and Quebec. And what we saw at the meeting between the Prime Minister and Premiers yesterday was that we have to put the priority on dialogue with a view to find not, finding not just a short-term solution but a long-term solution. And obviously, dialogue has limits, and the barricades do have to come down as quickly as possible, but peacefully. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Speaking of solutions, Mr. Speaker, at the Prime Minister's emergency meeting on Monday, 12 days after the start of the crisis, we noted that the RCMP commissioner was in attendance. So we can assume that a potential intervention to dismantle the blockades was on the table. Did the Prime Minister give any instruction whatsoever to the RCMP? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House. And I would invite my colleagues opposite to read the RCMP Act. We respect the independence of the RCMP in its operational decision-making, and I would encourage my colleague opposite to ask the member for Levy Belchasse, who was himself Prime uh, Minister of Public Safety, and at the time he told everyone that you have to respect the independence of the RCMP. We certainly do on this side of the House. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. I'd like to thank my colleague for his answer, but at the same time, I would say, yes, orders can be given, even though the government has denied it from the outset. The, can we not assume that the Prime Minister asked the RCMP to stand down? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the RCMP has its own procedures, just like the SQ and the OPP in other provinces, to handle this type of situation. On, in 2015, the member for Levy Belchasse said, he, I have full confidence in the decision and judgment of the RCMP. We respect their operational independence. The position hasn't changed since then, uh, when, from when he was minister to today. 
The government seems to think that the only way that these blockades will come to an end is by giving the blockaders whatever they want, by conceding to all of their demands. Well, Mr. Speaker, you get more of what you reward. If this government gives in to all the demands of the lawbreakers, it will get more law breaking. Every project in this country will be held hostage by those willing to stand on highways, at airports, and in front of trains. Mr. Speaker, how are we ever going to restore lawfulness and development in this country if this government makes concessions to reward those who've broken the law? Speaker, we fully understand the significant impacts that these blockades are having on the economy, small businesses and farmers, and we are with the railway employees who are facing uncertainty. We understand that the path forward is to a sustainable resolution of the blockades is through dialogue, and that's the approach we're taking. We're hoping for a swift resolution to ensure that Canadians affected by these blockades can return to work and that businesses can get their goods to market. Member for Carleton. The government says it understands the impact of these illegal blockades. You know who else understands the impact? The lawbreakers. They know the damage they're doing. And they know that the government is working to reward that damage. Every That's interest right. group in this country right. that wants to stop development or secure other self-serving concessions is watching carefully to find out what incentives the government is building in for that kind of lawless behaviour. So is this government really going to reward lawlessness and invite more of it? Mr. Speaker, the Conservative government is the Conservative Party is trying to offer up oversimplified solutions to a complex problem. The premiers agree that we need to pursue dialogue in order to resolve this situation peacefully, but dialogue has its limits, and the Canadian economy and workers and others are all being impacted. But let's pursue dialogue for the time being. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, the problem is that there's no more time left. The UPA is sounding the alarm. We're on the brink of a crisis. If the blockades don't come down, if rail traffic doesn't resume in the next few hours, we will have a full-scale propane shortage. Propane, Mr. Speaker, is what farmers use to heat their barns in deep February. The lives of entire herds of livestock are at stake. Farmers, in my writing, are worried. What concrete steps is the government going to take to resolve this crisis this weekend? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Secretary the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. I can reassure her all the Quebec members on this side of the House are very concerned about the situation, about the blockades on railway lines in Quebec and in Ontario. However, there is no simple solution to this problem. It's a complex one. It requires dialogue, and we are allowing dialogue every chance of success. The premiers acknowledged yesterday that we have to give dialogue a chance, but there are limits. It can't go on indefinitely, precisely because of the serious impacts on the Canadian economy, on farmers and businesses. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, the railway blockades crisis has already had major impacts on the economy of the Mauricie region. Our farmers and their animals are in jeopardy because of a shortage of propane. Two sawmills in Resolu sawmills are a few hours away from laying off all their employees. At uh, the port of Trois-Rivières, over 200 rail cars are overdue. What concrete steps is the government going to take to resolve the crisis and bring the blockades down this weekend? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I share the concerns of the member opposite. The situation is worrisome from the point of view of the economy, from the point of view of transportation, both of people and goods, and for the Canadian economy. The Prime Minister met with premiers yesterday, and there was progress made when the RCMP in BC decided to withdraw from Wet'suwet'en land. But dialogue is the preferred option, 
the premiers agree on this, but given the potential consequences, dialogue definitely has its limits. Gerdau, a large steel producer near my riding of Oshawa, is being negatively affected by these illegal blockades and the Prime Minister's inability to end them. The blockades are affecting the company's ability to transport goods and receive manufacturing supplies, and their steelmaking operations are now under threat. Hundreds of manufacturing jobs in my community could be at risk, and so are thousands across Ontario. If the Prime Minister never wants to end the illegal blockades, when can we expect to see his plan to support affected workers? Thank you, Secretary, Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and as I represent a community that is a manufacturing community, I understand the question and I understand the concerns and the significant impacts that manufacturers are facing. We understand that the path forward is through sustainable resolution of the blockades and it's through dialogue, and that's the approach that we're using. We're hoping for a swift resolution to ensure that Canadians impacted by these blockades can return to work and businesses can get their goods to market. Well, member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, 34 Canadian organizations representing multiple sectors from across the country, employing millions of Canadians, wrote the Prime Minister. They expressed how the activist blockades are creating serious problems for interprovincial trade, public service, businesses, workers, and families. That's right. And they said for every day that the rail lines are down, it will take at least four days to just catch up. Wow. Will this Prime Minister create a plan for our economy to catch up if these blockades are ever dismantled? Great question. Honourable Parliament Secretary the Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, and as I've said, we understand the impact of these blockades. They are uh, potentially devastating on many communities, on industry, on farmers. But the path forward is through a sustainable and lasting resolution, is through dialogue, and that's the approach we're taking. We're looking forward to a swift resolution and to ensure that all Canadians who are impacted by these blockades can return to work and businesses can get their goods to market. Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Transportation told this House that re via rail service is now operating between Ottawa and Montreal. The Minister also said he's a frequent via rail traveller, which is very convenient for him and fellow Montreal area MPs. I was surprised to learn that via rail is not operating to Atlantic Canada. In fact, via is not running any services between Montreal and Halifax. But these illegal blockades are located in western and central Canada, not down east. So why is VIA Rail not running in Atlantic Canada? Mr. Speaker, we know how disruptive some of the blockades have been for the travelling public. VIA Rail is a very important service that connects our communities. VIA Rail has removed some service in the corridor. We understand that the path forward to a sustainable solution is through dialogue, and that's the approach we're using. We're working tirelessly to end the blockades and resume rail passenger service as quickly as we can. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. Mr. Speaker, given that VIA Rail is a Crown Corporation subsidized to the tune of nearly $400 million annually by all taxpayers, what has the cost been to VIA, VIA Rail been due to the illegal blockades across the country? And when will the Crown be initiating legal action for damages for the millions of dollars in lost revenue against the organizers of these illegal yeah. blockades? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we know the importance of Via Rail to Canadians across the country and the importance of connecting travellers, connecting families, and to our communities. But the way to resolve this, uh, this blockade in an effective manner is through dialogue, and that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, we want to ensure that these blockades end and resume passenger rail as quickly as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Mr. Speaker, meeting with the Wet'suwet'en chiefs would be a step in the right direction for reconciliation, but what we're seeing again is the Prime Minister failing. His broken promises to the people in my riding are seen every day with lack of and poor health care, mental health care, housing, education and transportation. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals supported our motion on suicide prevention, but when it comes to action, we see broken promises. Why are the Liberals so committed to denying basic human rights for Indigenous people? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Spe
Parliament Secretary, the Honourable Minister of Northern Affairs. Further from the truth, our government is committed to improving the quality of life for Northerners. In the last uh, few years, we've invested $40 million over five years to support options for post-secondary education in the North and the Arctic. And through our national housing strategy, uh, we are helping more than three thousand northerners uh, find a place to call home we've signed 10-year agreements with the three territories which will invest over 550 million dollars in housing for the north and we've signed a 10-year agreement with itk which will invest 400 million for housing in the north we know there is a lot of work to do uh, and we are committed to getting it done in partnership honorable member for courtney alberni mr speaker in my writing 11 years after the supreme court reaffirmed the rights of five new Chalant nations to catch and sell fish in their territory the government has still not negotiated an agreement instead they've spent over 19 million dollars fighting these nations and their rights in court look across the country today and it's clear the prime minister's words of nation to nation relationships fall flat Mr. Speaker, that's why the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs are asking for a face-to-face -face meeting. When will the Prime Minister answer their call? Here, here. Oh. Oh. The Honourable Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Government of, of Canada is working collaboratively with the five uh, New Child and First Nations to advance reconciliation with regards to their right to fish and sell fish. An incremental reconciliation agreement for fish resource resources was concluded in September of 2019 and subsequently we moved forward collaboratively with, collaboratively with more comprehensive reconciliation negotiations for fisheries resources. At the same time, our government is working closely and in collaboration with BC First Nations and stakeholders towards a renewed salmon allocation policy and is in line with the court's decision and respects Indigenous rights. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Scarborough, Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, communities across Canada are benefiting from projects under the the Green Municipal Fund, a, bi a one billion program funded by the Government of Canada and delivered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Cities are terrific partners in pioneering practical climate solutions. By supporting municipalities in their efforts to build more resilient communities, we're helping Canadians across the country mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. Can the Minister of Infrastructure tell this House how we can work together to create good middle class jobs, protect the environment, and grow? the economy. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. Member for a question. Uh, it was great to sit down recently with big city mayors, with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, to discuss our common priorities from public transit to green infrastructure. We announced 10 new projects under the Green Municipal Fund, projects such as a pilot project for Saskatoon to test electric buses, funding for Calgary to study fuel alternatives for its waste and recycle services fleet, a stormwater project for Fort York Region and Lake Simcoe. Local leaders know what's right for their communities. We're committed to working with them. Honourable member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, Alberta experienced its first blockade in my riding of Sturgeon River Parkland. A critical CN rail line that moves over $100 million a day in goods was blocked. Many of these goods are hazardous materials. These blockades pose a threat to public safety. Counter-protesters counter removed the barricades, and Canadians are frustrated and concerned that there will be violence. So when will this Liberal government take strong action, restore the rule of law, and end these blockades? Mr. Speaker, we recognize the hardships that these blockades have caused on millions of Canadians, on the Canadian economy, uh, and it is our, um, our undertaking to have a CNN to this situation, uh, to have the blockades, uh, uh, see the blockades go down. However, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we're working with the RCMP, with our provincial counterparts, who favor the same approach that we're taking, which is to give chance to dialogue, but dialogue has its limits, Mr. Speaker. The blockades must go down. Uh, however, I would warn that it is very irresponsible for citizens to take the matters into their own, own hands. Law enforcement is the proper way to do it, and I suggest the member opposite tells Peter McKay. Honourable member for Prince Albert. Mr. Speaker, last night I received an email from Kevin, a farmer outside the Shelbrooke area in my riding. Kevin has a half million dollars worth of undeliverable contracts that I can't deliver on. A month from now, road bans are going to hit. Grain elders are saying they need at least two weeks to clear the backlog. When can I tell Kevin the barricades will be taken down? And in the meantime, where can Kevin send his bills? Yeah. 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 
Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we understand the pain that this uh, blockade is causing farmers and businesses across the country. But a pathway to a lasting resolution of this is through open and respectful dialogue. That is the path that we are taking. That is the path that will resolve this peacefully, uh, situation peacefully, and that's the path we're taking. For Cypress Hills Grasslands. Mr. Speaker, farmers are feeling the damaging effects of the illegal rail blockades. They aren't getting paid because the elevators are either full or won't accept any more grains or pulse crops. 85 ships are in the Vancouver Harbour waiting to be loaded. If the shipments don't arrive on time, farmers will now also have to pay demerge charges. One farmer from my riding named Doug shared with me that he even had to start withdrawing his RRSPs just to pay the bills. There is no more time to wait. When will the Prime Minister support farmers and stand up against the illegal blockades? When? When? We understand the significant impacts across the country on farmers, on small businesses, on manufacturers and employees that work in these industries. But we understand clearly, Mr. Speaker, that the path forward to a sustainable and lasting resolution is through dialogue. We are hoping for a swift resolution and ensure that Canadians affected by these blockades can return to work and businesses can get their goods to market. Honourable Member for Paul Cartier. Mr. Speaker, we've had 16 days of Liberal government inaction, and Canadians are being held hostage. Businesses and consumers may face rationing as though in wartime. In Pernod Jacques Cartier, the company called Chemco, which supplies airplane de-icing fluid to the Quebec City in Mirabel airports, is running out of stock. So how are we supposed to keep people safe? Supermarket shelves are starting to empty out. We need urgent action. When will the member uh, take action to end the blockade? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I share my colleagues' concerns. Uh, this is a very concerning situation uh, from the point of view of the economic uh, of uh, Canada's economy. We can see that this is having a significant impact on our economy and our society. We want those barricades to come down as soon as possible. But, and this is what the provincial premiers agreed to yesterday, we need to give dialogue a chance so that we can find a peaceful solution to this solution. Dialogue does have its limits, Mr. Speaker, given the economic impacts uh, that this is having, you know, I, but I think it would be counterproductive to uh, set a firm timeline. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, Quebec has a serious labour shortage. Companies are turning down contracts because they don't have enough staff to ensure production. Farmers have to worry every year that they won't have enough full-time workers for the harvest season. Now, the temporary foreign worker program is supposed to solve this problem, but it's so slow and cumbersome that it's not able to do so. Will the federal government let Quebec handle temporary foreign workers, as it's been asking for for the last 18 months? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Labour. Here, and I thank the Honourable Member for this uh, very important question. This government is uh, committed to working with our provincial partners and our, and our local partners on this issue. We are aware that there is an increased volume of LMIA applications in Quebec. We understand the urgency of the labour shortage in Quebec, and we are taking ad action to address it. In 2019-2020, we hired 34 new staff in Quebec. We reallocated $1.7 million within ESDC to address the backlog and reviewed and streamlined processes. I understand the importance of temporary workers in Quebec, and our department continues to work to address this back backlog. We will continue to monitor the situation very closely. La la. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the labour market impact assessments that are required by the government take forever. They're long, cumbersome, cumbersome and very expensive. Spring is on the way, then summer will be here and our farmers will need workers in the field just like they do every year. As a gesture of good faith, the government could start by handing full responsibility for labour market assessments over to Quebec. In fact, it could do so tomorrow. Is it open to that idea? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for the uh, uh, honourable member for the excellent question. Again, we are aware of the increased uh, volume of LMIA applications. We have invested $8.1 million to reduce the volume of applications because we understand how important this program is to employers. This investment in itself has decreased the backlog by 1,400 applications. We will continue to work to ensure that this program works for employers, 
for workers and for Canadian economy, and we are committed to working with our provincial partners to improve this program. Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's weakness is costing Canada's economy once again. People in Alberta and across the country have lost all faith in this government's willingness to end illegal blockades. The pressures facing families and communities are leaving some Canadians so frustrated they removed one of the blockades themselves. The Prime Minister's weak leadership is creating the circumstances for dangerous uh, vigilantism. On what day will I be able to tell the businesses in my riding that they can finally resume the transportation of their products? Here, here. Honourable Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize the hardships that these blockades have uh, placed upon many Canadians all across this country and uh, on the Canadian economy. However, uh, there is no simple solution to such a complex problem. The premiers of the provinces and the prime minister have discussed yesterday, and they've agreed that we need to give dialogue uh, all the place, Mr. Speaker, but that dialogue has its limits and that uh, we, these blockades must go down. However, I would advise the member opposite to discourage any and all citizens who might be tempted to uh, go into vigilante justice. This is not the path forward. We have to trust law enforcement in this country, Mr. Speaker, to apply the law. The Honourable Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. Mr. Speaker, last week I visited Bimbo Canada Bakery in my Langley riding. They produce an impressive 9,000 loaves of bread an hour at their plant. And they're very proud of the fact that they use only the highest quality Canadian prairie wheat flour for their products. As Phil showed us around, he spoke about the rail blockades impeding their shipments of that key ingredient to their bakeries across Canada. Without flour, production stops. What does the Prime Minister plan to say to Canadians when the bread runs out? Let them eat cake? And I, we do appreciate the concerns and the hardships faced by small business owners, um, farmers and manufacturers across this country. But the path ahead is through dialogue, Mr. Speaker. And it's unfortunate. Order. 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 Uh, these, uh, these shouts in unison are, are not helping uh, the situation any. And I appreciate I know that honourable members will want to hear the responses to the parliamentary secretaries and ministers. So let's uh, try and have uh, some quiet and we'll, we'll hear what they have to say. The honourable parliamentary secretary. Mr. Speaker, it's disappointing that the Conservative Party would laugh at a, com at a resolution to this through peaceful dialogue that, that calls from the other side to make illegal orders to the RCMP or send in the army or calls on future leaders of their party through vigilantism is unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. We want a lasting solution, and that path is through peace and through dialogue. The Honourable Member for Bow River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know the government is seized and needs WD-40, but radical activists, many have no connection to wet, sweating people, are holding our country's economy hostage. We have a right to freedom of speech, freedom to protest, which I strongly defend, but we don't have the right to shut down railways, ports, impede freedom of movement, and block producers from getting their goods to market. The situation has gone on far too long. Canadians are fed up with the inaction. Why won't the Minister of Public Safety direct to enforce the law? Mr. Speaker, to answer directly the question from the member opposite, because we respect the independence of law enforcement in this country, a principle that's been recognized only by the Supreme Court, but by former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, by the former Minister of Public Safety that sits right across the aisle here. But to hear them laugh at such a serious matter uh, is unbecoming of the Conservative Party. Mr. Speaker, the path forward for a peaceful resolution of this conflict is through dialogue. Dialogue has its limit, Mr. Speaker. We've discussed with the premiers of the provinces yesterday, and we're working around the clock to put an end to this situation. Thank you very much. Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Mr. Speaker, last June, the House of Commons passed a motion declaring a national climate emergency in Canada. Each one of us in this House has a role to play in the fight against climate change. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage tell this House what he is doing to make progress on this issue? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell for the question and for his hard work on this file. 
As you know, protecting the environment has always been and will always be a priority for me. I'm happy to sit with so many people who care about the environment as much as I do. As you also know, raising public awareness about climate change is essential if we are to meet our objectives. I've been working on my colleagues with my colleagues on this question, and I intend to carry out the mandate given to me by the Prime Minister to partner with national museums to inform Canadians about climate change. I had the opportunity to see what the Canadian Museum of Nature and the Museum of Science and Technology have done to raise awareness about this issue. Thank you. Honourable member for Tamik Mactaquac. Mr. Speaker, 24,000 people in New Brunswick rely on the forestry sector for their livelihood. This Prime Minister has already hurt the industry through poorly negotiated trade deals, and his inaction on blockades is hurting them again. I am hearing from Forestry New Brunswick that thousands of jobs contracts and contracts are in jeopardy if this current disruption of rail and port services continues even one more week. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister move beyond the politics of endless dialogue, dither and delay, and take action so that I can tell the forestry workers of New Brunswick that the blockades are coming down? Mr. Speaker, and we understand the impacts on the economy not only for the forestry sector but for sectors across the country. And it's unfortunate again that the Conservatives will laugh when the topic of dialogue is mentioned, but a path forward for a lasting solution is through peaceful dialogue. It has its limits, but that is the path that we are taking, and we place our trust in law enforcement to do their job, but we will do ours, and that is through negotiations. The Honourable Member for Regina Lubin. Mr. Speaker, we have almost 100 ships waiting to be loaded, a backup of 20,000 grain cars costing farmers more than $300 million. Where is our Ag Minister? She's away in Washington at a forum on Agriculture Outlook. I can already tell the Ag Minister what that outlook is for Canadian agriculture producers. It is bleak. Why is she dining with diplomats in Washington instead of being here, working with the incident response team, standing up for farmers, trying to resolve the crisis of the illegal blockades? The Honourable Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I have said, we understand the impacts that have been effect, uh, felt across the country, including in our agriculture sector, with our farmers that want to get their goods to market. We want a lasting solution to, this, uh, to these blockades, and that is through dialogue. That is, that is our place. We trust law enforcement to do their job, but we will do ours, and that is through discussion. Honourable Member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Mr. Speaker, Canada has grounded to a halt because of a weak Prime Minister. The Liberals are kowtowing to a few radical protesters. They are paralyzed. They are legitimizing these illegal blockades that are costing us hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of jobs. In Pitt Meadows and Maple Ridge, commuters worry that the West Coast Express will be shut down again, stranding them. Mr. Speaker, when will the Liberals wake up, stop sleeping at the wheels, and take the barricades down? Here, here. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for his question. Now, it's clear that this is a very concerning situation from an economic point of view. Our government is dealing with the issue, and I think it's worth mentioning that there have been positive developments. For example, the RCMP's decision in BC to withdraw from the Wet'suwet'en Territory. Uh, we've also seen collaboration between the provincial governments and the federal government. And the premiers agree that they should give a chance to dialogue. Of course, that can't continue forever, uh, given the economic impacts uh, that exist that my colleague expressed well. On a vista, Buren, Trinity. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Red Deer, St. John, Lethbridge, St. Albert, Fort McMurray, and Vancouver. All cities that are planning to ban or have banned the harmful practice of conversion therapy. In 2019, our government committed to amending the criminal code to ban the practice of conversion therapy. Can the Minister of Justice share with the House what action our government is taking to put an end to this harmful practice? Yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Bonavista, Burin, uh, Trinity, for the question. Mr. Speaker, conversion therapy is a cruel exercise that leads to lifelong trauma for victims. It's a harmful and degrading practice that has no place in Canada. I commend the municipalities that he mentioned, and in particular those in Alberta, for showing leadership on this file. I hope those members opposite Mr. Speaker 
who represent those communities in this House will be with us as we move forward to ban this shameful practice. Call the member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, when the Liberal government bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline, they told Canadians it would cost $7.4 billion. But a recent report that explains why the cost has risen to $13 billion is being hidden from Canadians. Now, economist Robin Allen has shown that this new cost means that there will be no added benefits for the Canadian Treasury from this pipeline. And the $500 million that the government claims will be available annually for climate action is pure fiction. Now, from the start, this government has been loose with the facts about this project. So when will they release the report and come clean with Canadians? Here, here. Right. Honourable Minister of Middle Class Prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the honourable colleague for his question. At a time when most of our energy exports go to the United States and the economies of Alberta and Saskatchewan are struggling, Canadians know that we need to open up new international markets. Getting our resources to global markets in a way that is efficient and safe is Canada's best interest. The TMX project will create thousands of good middle tax jobs, accelerate Canada's clean energy transition, and open up new avenues for Indigenous economic prosperity. We are confident that the project remains a responsible investment and that it will generate a positive return for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Post-secondary students in Canada graduate burdened with debt from high tuition fees and the high cost of living. The interest rates they pay on their student loans is almost double the rate paid on the average home mortgage. By comparison, in Northern European countries, university tuition is tuition-free and students receive financial support. These economies have seen the benefits. Students in Canada need debt relief now. Will this government, at the very least, eliminate the interest on federal student loans and give our students a break? Well, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the excellent question. We know that education is vital to succeeding in our modern workforce, and that's why we're investing in Canadians and their futures. To help Canadians reach their full potential, we will increase the Canada Student Grant by $1,200, extend Canada's student loan repayment grace period from six months to two years after graduation. We're going to give parents with student loans a repayment grace period of five years, or until their child turns five, and increase the threshold of the repayment assistant program so that students don't need to start repaying their loans until they are making over $35,000. That's how we're helping the middle class and those working hard to join it. That will uh, conclude question period for today. Tabling of documents, dépôt de documents. Good job. Good job.